lived a very nice crowd this morning. It's great to worship God with you. We've appreciated our um, participation in everyone in our singing and our prayers and the communion and contribution. At this time of our service, we're going to study a very important part of God's holy and divine will. There's an enormous amount of information about the sins of the time. I've chosen this title. It's actually the same title of a couple of work booklets that I use on a regular basis in home studies and when we're studying Christian character. However, the Bible has so much to say about the sins of the time that it is impossible to practically use and cover all of this in one sermon. I have picked and cho chose a few, just very few, of the points. I would encourage you at any time that you're so disposed to do so is to keep an eye on passages of Scripture as you read and as you study about the time. Read and look at throughout the Scriptures, even in your regular daily Bible reading, and notice these many, many passages. The, the list of sins, you know, specific sins, is just enormous there and throughout the Scriptures. And then to add um, really good, better, and best, add some great things, is that a variety of translations will utilize a variety of words to emphasize the same sin of the time. So therefore, whenever you're studying the sins of the time, you may have a word that you know basically in your judgment and your mind what it would mean, but it's really good to see that in a variety of translations. And then within our congregation, we have a variety of people that use a different translation of choice. That's your privilege to do whatever and read whatever translation you prefer. But it's so very, very, very valuable to all of us to make sure we understand what this sin is all about as you're going through one, two, three of the sins of the time. This morning, we're going to go right through this material in a rapid fashion. We're going to just mention a few of these. I do not anticipate teaching anything that you've not already learned. I do anticipate being like the Apostle Peter said. He said, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, speaking of his body, I'm going to remind you of all the things that I've spoken unto you. And he said, I want all these things that you've heard through the years to be brought back to your attention. And that's what we plan to do again this morning. Okay, let's look at point number one here. Did you know that in Exodus 20, now this is where the Lord gives the Ten Commandments. So out of these Ten Commandments, two of these Ten Commandments has regard to the time. I'd like for you to look at the third commandment, please. As a matter of fact, I mentioned here the third command and the ninth command. This all has reference to the time. The third of the Ten Commandments said, Ye shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, Christian friends, listen. We've got a face in music. People are taking the name of the Lord in vain by using his name as an exclamation. What do you say when you have, hear a loud noise that just kind of jars you, kind of wakes you up? What kind of words do you use during this time? It is a condemnation given by God that to take his name in vain is a violation of the original Ten Commandments. And in the New Testament, there are many passages that equally teach uh, this truth, that we do not want to take the name of the Lord, our God, in vain. When I think of taking his name in vain, you know, I know I, I hear people, and, and I, I'm not saying I never have done it, I have done it, but I have really tried to weed that out of my vocabulary. Gosh, people use gosh all the time. That's using, it's a euphemism for the word God. G, euphemism for Jesus. Golly, again, that, listen to yourself. If you're using God's name in vain, that is, you're using God's name in a way not to give him honor and respect and reverence, but you're using it as a byword or the slang word, that's a problem. You've got to come to grip with that and flush that out of your your vocabulary and hold tight to speaking God's name only with honor and reverence. The Word of God is so abundantly clear on that that there's no reason for anybody to argue about it. Just do what God's Word teaches. 
So let us really be mindful of just hear and listen to ourselves. Help our spouses. Help our children. Yes, help your parents, grandparents. When we hear words that are coming out of our mouth that are not in conjunction with giving honor and praise to God, we need to improve on that. Point number nine, or verse number nine here, the ninth of the Ten Commandments. It said, ye shall not bear false witness. False witness is another way of condemning lying. But it's so very important because a false witness, you remember when Jesus was being uh, in his court trial, they, brought, they couldn't find anything legitimate, so they got false witnesses to come witness against Jesus. They had nothing. They were, they were lying through their teeth, and this is very serious. I just want everybody to know that the abuse of the tongue or sins of the tongue is a violation even from thousands of years ago, and the Lord gave the Ten Commandments. Two of them had to do with sin of the tongue. Okay, let's look at the next one. And Proverbs, the sixth chapter. If you're so disposed, if you would turn with me to Solomon's writing, uh, Proverbs, the sixth chapter. I want to read verses 16 through 19, and then we're going to hone in on the parts that deal with the sins of the time. But I want to make it abundantly clear here. The Word of God said, God hates these sins. Now that he don't like them a little bit, he hates them. The word hate is very clear, very easy for men you to understand. And Proverbs, the sixth chapter, please. This is reading from the King James Version. The word of God said, These are the six things the Lord hates. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imagination, feet that are swift to run to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and, and ones who sow discord among the brethren. In this particular area, it becomes abundantly clear. There are three things. Now, these little numbers here are simply the verses in Proverbs 6, chapter. Proverbs 6, verse 17, he condemned a lying tongue. Now we can tell already just from what other passages we referred to and the reference that we made, God hates it when you lie. Now think about that. He hates it when you lie. And we're not going to let up on that throughout the lesson. And it's very careful that we need to be uh, on top of our speech. The Word of God has given us some very plain, some very practical teaching to help us be godly in our way of living and in our mouth, our tongue, our speech. He, the Bible said God hates a lying tongue. Now you remember that, and I need to always remember that. You don't want to speak in a way, and we talked about euphemisms up here, uh, about the Ten Commandments and taking the Lord God's name in vain, but also we need to be very mindful of the fact that when the Bible said God hates the lying tongue, that means we don't want to lie, but we're going to lose that battle with God. There are many occasions in Scripture where people lie that they paid a dear price for. And as time progresses throughout the lesson today, we may get one or two of those, but it'll be very, very brief to just bring it to your remembrance. But now what we understand in verse 19, the false witness. Now these two are very similar to the two of the commandments of the Ten Commandments, a lying tongue and a false witness. You know, it is so easy to tell a lie, but it's much easier to tell the truth. I've heard it from the time I was a kid all the way up that my parents would say, no, you tell the truth. You be open, you be honest. Yes, you might even get in trouble. You might even get a spanking. But it's much better to lay it all on the table, tell the truth, Take your punishment if you've done something wrong or said something wrong. But the main thing is God hates it when you lie. So, friends, I want us to make sure. Get your lifestyle in a way where you don't have to lie. I've known great brethren and sisters who have quit their career because they're getting to a point where they're having to tell lies to satisfy upper management. Dear friend, there's no excuse for lying. Okay, 
So when you look at the Proverbs 6 and 16 to 19, and you find that God hates the lying tongue, verse 17, he hates the false witness, verse 19, and look what else he hates. He hates those who sow discord among the brethren. It's not he hates the person. He hates the sin the person commits. But we need to make sure, and I am so thankful, so thankful for every brother and every sister of this home congregation at 21st Street. We don't have people who sow discord among brethren. You've heard me say it before. The Lord be willing. You can hear me say it many times more. It takes one person to cause discord among brethren and create quite a bit of strife in a congregation. And to my knowledge, we don't have a single person in our congregation who's doing that. And it will be met head on with elders and deacons and teachers. You know, things will be dealt with. But we don't want anybody to ever be a one person, that one person that would ever cause the problem. We want to make sure that no one sows discord among brethren because souls are lost when that happens unless people correct it with the Lord. So let us be understanding this, that we need to make sure that we do not sow discord among brethren and speak evil or bad or put people in a bad light. And really, we many times people do that, they go on hearsay. Not even that it's true. It's just what well, they kind of imagine or they think it. Listen, everything you think doesn't need to be spoken. Plain and simple. Keep your mouth shut, in other words, many, many times. If I have a chance, everything I'm pushing toward the end, we'll see how much I can get covered. But it's so very important. But listen, make sure that in our lifetime, we never are guilty of sowing discord among brethren. Verse 19. These are all from God. I'm just giving you the message. These are from the scriptures. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, Jesus hones in on this topic. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 16 and verse 17, quite interesting passage here. Jesus did not pull any punches whatsoever when he said the following. I say unto you, every idle word that men should speak, they should give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words thou shalt be justified, and by your words thou shalt be condemned. Wow. Jesus honed in very early in his ministry, laying this out very strong. Every idle word. You know, several years ago, Brother Mike Trichwell, which is Angela's brother, Allison Alden's uncle, Mike Trichwell wrote a great commentary in the book of Matthew. And one day as I was reading and studying on Matthew 12, 36 and 37, this down here, I pulled out my, Mike's commentary on Matthew, and I was reading it, and in verse 36 and 37, he let it be made known. Notice the word. Notice the verse. It didn't say every evil word that man should speak, but it said every idle word that man should speak. We would all readily, eagerly agree if it's an evil word, we should not be saying it, and God would not be pleased with that. But in, in Mike's commentary, he said he didn't say every evil word, but every idle word. An idle word is an unproductive, unnecessary word or phrase that we might use that's in a, in a destructive way. God hates that. Not only that, Jesus said, listen, every, listen, every, every pretty inclusive now, every idle word that men should speak would give an account that of the day of judgment. That day of judgment is going to be a day of all other days. Every idle, can you imagine every idle word? So in other words, think before you speak. And just because you think it doesn't mean you should say it. I've had people say, well, if you think it, that's what I said. Wrong. I don't know how many times I've said that to people. Wrong. No way. Everything you think you ought to be able to say, get real. That's not the way it works. It's so very important today that we be mindful of every every word we speak and make sure that whatever we speak is appropriate. That is full of self-examination on a regular, ongoing basis. So when you read Matthew 12, you're reading the words of Jesus, the Son of the Almighty God. This is very important. But look at this fourth passage. And I just select these just to utilize in this sermon today. But in Ephesians 4 and 29... 
The Apostle Paul, who wrote this wonderful congregation of Ephesus, Ephesians 4 and 29, he says, Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. But, in contrast, but, here's what needs to come out, that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may bring grace in the heart of the hearer. Wow, what a great contrast in one passage. But the early part shows the sin of the tongue, let no, no, zero, error, no communication, corrupt communication come out of your mouth. You just make sure that you keep your mouth in check. I need to make sure I keep mine in check. My mouth, my tongue, what I think, what I say. I need to make sure I do that. And so do you. This is so important. Do you realize the danger zone spiritually we would find ourselves if we did not keep our tongue, speech, in check? When Paul said, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, you know what he meant? He meant let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. He meant exactly what he said. No ifs, no ands, no buts. So therefore, these are just four passages to get you to thinking, I should read in the Old Testament or the New Testament here. I do want every one of us to grow in this area. We may have picked up bad habits. I understand how that goes. But that doesn't make it right. We just need to get rid of bad habits as we grow spiritually. Okay, let's continue on. Now go with me to the book of James. Now all of these verses here will come from James. The whole lesson can be preached from the book of James. Actually, the whole lesson can be preached from preaching on James 3. However, I did go ahead this morning as I was picking and choosing which material to cover today. I just decided to have this one little section from the book of James. In James 1 verse 19, the Bible said, Be swift to hear, be slow to speak, be slow to wrath. In other words, slow down. Be slow to be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. Think before you speak. Wait. Have a sound judgment, sound mind in what you're getting ready to play. Say, think about it before you say it. This might make for a long conversation when everybody does that, but it'll make a very safe conversation. We need to come up with a good, solid one-liner that when people are speaking inappropriately to us or in our earshot, we need to, no, we don't do that. We don't do that here. We don't do that. If it's so in discord among brethren, it's like, we don't do that. That's condemned in Scripture. I want everybody to understand. Swift to hear is not hard to understand. Then this is slow, slow here both times, slow to speak, slow to write. Wow, slow to speak. That's quite interesting. Are we that way? You know what happens? I, I love I, I'm a, I love observing people. Sometimes I do observe myself too. I, I readily agree. But you know when somebody is talking and they're telling you about this story or this event or this circumstance they found themselves in, and while they're talking, it makes you think of something else. And then next thing you know, you're doing the talking and you're not listening. Was it? Swift to hear. Swift to hear. Don't interrupt them. Let them talk. Listen to what they have to say. Then be slow to speak and slow to rap. You know, when people call me from just like other preachers and church leaders across the country, but when people call and they have a circumstance and they give you a little bit of information, your advice, and it's good advice, no doubt. I believe all of you can give good advice. But your advice is always only as good as the material you have to work with. Please understand that. Your advice, when you've got limited material, you only have limited able to advise. One statement, changing a do to a don't, changing a yes to a no, and all of this type of a thing, they can change your advice altogether. So therefore, you need to let people know, with what you told me, I would suggest this. But now when someone else tells me something different, slanted differently, it may change. I've told people that I'm thinking hundreds of times. Because I don't want to be the guy that's caught in the middle of two guys shooting each other. Pardon the pun. Shooting each other. 
And then we find a situation where if people would have listened and people would have spoken truthfully, there would not be a complication. Thank you for not being the person who does that. But we find right here, the Bible said, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You slow to get angry. Slow, slow, slow. I just wonder how many of us that way. We need to be. We need to be. Now look at James 1 and 26. If a man does not bridle his tongue, this is the King James Version wording. If he does not bridle his tongue, if he doesn't, then his religion is vain. Wow, that's a heavy now. That's really, really heavy. If you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is vain. If any man thinks himself to be religious, James 1 said, if you think it to be religious, but you don't broaden your tongue, your religion is vain. I didn't paraphrase that. I just quoted it. That's what God's Word said. Now, that's a pretty solid hit. Now, we need to look at these verses, you know, many times, that we need to overcome this as a, as a brotherhood and as Bible students. But many times, we have the verse almost like it's isolated to teach one thing. While many verses have numerous things they teach, several things. I love it when people take a verse and dissect it. You talk about the word, the phrases, the passage, the enlarged passage, and even the longer passage. But we need to make sure because we want to gather all the information on a topic. But if we don't rattle our tongue, this is an ongoing basis. When you're feeling good, you talk one way. When you're not feeling good, you may talk another. Let us make sure that we think before we speak. It's so important. We can avoid sins of the tongue. We can avoid hurting people's feelings. We can avoid sowing discord among brethren. We can avoid all that by thinking before we speak and keeping the mouth shut when you know, I don't need to say what I just thought. Okay. Now, let's look at chapter 3, verse 1 through 18. I'm not going to read all 18 verses. I'm going to pick out a couple, though, and reference them, please. Now, what I'm going to reference, and I decided to do it this way, I'm going to reference the fact that the Bible talks about how small your tongue is, and it's a small member of your body. But as small as it is, it can create a powerful amount of problems for you spiritually, for me spiritually, for our spiritual family. It can cause tremendous problems. So let us be the men and the women who really are mindful that this small member of our body can make such an impact. Then he gives us three or four good examples, examples that we can relate to. These are all from God. Now, God told us this. I'm going to share it with you, okay? He said, these are all the verses now from James 3, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6. And I just quit there instead of going on through verse 18. Like I said, we could talk about the whole lesson on James 3. He said, when you put the bit in the horse's mouth, you can control him, some translation. He will obey you, other translations. But it just shows the small bit compared to how huge your horse is, the small bit would change the direction he's riding. He would advance, he would slow down, he would stop, he would go right, he would go left. Guess what? It's a very small bit that you put in a horse's mouth and you control that big old beast. That was given by the Lord to illustrate how big one animal is, however, how small the little bit is that you can use to control. And what is showing is your, your time is so small they can control quite a bit in your spiritual life. And you need to be careful. I do too. We all do. As a group, as a family. Your physical family, your spiritual family. Then, in verse 4, he said, the very small rudder on the ship. You know, the, that rudder on the ship. I don't know, you can talk about these humongous gr cruise liner. But in comparison to a, a cruise liner that is 10, 15, 20 stories tall and they have a small helm that would dictate going to the right, going to the left, going straight ahead. It is amazing. When the Lord uses different analogies to help us draw an understanding, therefore you have the horse, you've got a big old ship, then it said, a great forest, a little fire will kindle. You can have massive, massive forests 
and somebody can set up a very small, you know, maybe campfire, very, very small in comparison to hundreds of thousands of acres. But people, you've seen this on the news before, I've done it before, people at times lose control of that. They maybe have that small fire today they shouldn't have had any fire. And I appreciate the fire alarms that they give, you know, and a warning they give on news and things that people need to, don't, it's a no burn ban right now. You know, not right now, but just in their teaching and talking to it. But it's so important. Now he talks about here how this small kindled fire called in the great forest to burn up. You know, nearly every year you hear of, of massive fires in different parts of the country that destroy hundreds and thousands of acres. Just think about your small member of your town and how if it is left uncontrolled, not monitored, it can create a lot of so we're learning in this lesson, we need to keep our mouth shut sometime, and we need to make sure how we speak is appropriate, because God can hear it all. And then we learn, notice here in verse 6 here, he said, you defile the whole body by the abuse of the tongue. You set on fire by hell, King James Version. It is, this is the one word. Now listen here, this is very important and a very interesting point. This word hell right here is from the Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is not written in your Bible unless you're using a translation that will bring it to light and in the, in the, using a Greek word or, in order to help you to understand better. And that's where these modern verses, like Brother Alice read, the Sixth Version, and some read the English Standard, and New American Standard was another great one. Many good versions, but here's the deal. When you read that, it helps to understand it. But your whole body is set on fire Destruction. When you think of fire, you think of destruction in Gehenna hell. Listen, Jesus is the only person who used Gehenna hell. Gehenna hell is one of three English, uh, three Greek words. You have Hades, where everybody goes, and that's where the rich man was. He woke up in hell. You remember that was Hades. He woke up in the Hadean realm. He woke up in a place that number two is called Tartarus. But those are the things we're not talking about today. But the third one, Gehenna, that is the hell of all hell. That is the one that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. That is the one that's not an annihilation. It is a, a painful separation from God. James, the brother of our Lord, this is the only person and the only time Gehenna hell is mentioned by anybody other than Jesus and is used by Jesus' brother one time in Scripture. Very interesting. Okay, sin of the tongue, I only mentioned three. This would be a great lesson for any of the brethren to give any time they wanted to. It would be a, a probably a good lesson or two or three because there's so many mentioned in Scripture. He mentioned lying tongue. I did not mention as much over here about it, but the lying tongue. In John 8, 44, it said the devil is the father of lies. So when we lie, we're acting like the devil. Wow. And then in Revelation 21, verse 8, it says, All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. All liars will have their part if they die of that condition in Gehenna hell. You know what that should make us do? Tell the truth. All right. In Acts 5, verse 1 through 11, I'm not telling this whole story, but it's a case of Ananias and Sapphira. This is the first recorded problem in the New Testament church. It started in chapter 2, the church did, and then chapter 3 and 4, great things are happening, and then all of a sudden, chapter 5, we had a problem with the husband and wife. They made an, an agreement to lie, to lie to God. Wow! And then, they did, the man died, and God said, you died, and he died right then. Three hours later, his wife did not realize she was a widow. She told the same lie. Guess what? She died right there on the spot. And they picked her up, took her out, and buried her by her husband. Because they lied. Not because of what they did. Nobody had told them, you've got to give everything you sell your goods for. They didn't say you had to do that. But they wanted to credit as if they did. You see, you may thought, that's not a big deal. It was a big deal to Adam and Sapphira. And it was a big deal to God. 
I just want us to really hone in. You younger people, please hone in. Understand. Tell the truth. Adults, tell the truth. Parent the child, child the parent. Be careful. But make sure we tell the truth in these things. Because we're learning some things that can make a difference. Not to Acts 5, 1 through 11. Not to not a little night in devotion to encourage your children and your family devotion that uh, we do have, right? That we want to keep the thing going. Backbiter, you know, backbiter is just scary, yucky sin. Backbiters, when you tell, you talk about people to their back, you bite them. You bite them to the back. You don't say it to the face, you want to say it to somebody else to the back. Listen, that is condemned in Scripture. You have Proverbs 25 and 23. Nearly every one of these are condemned in Old and New Testament. Then I went on to put Romans, the Old Testament, New Testament, Romans 1, 28 through 30. That's just part of the condemnation passages of these. But my friend, the sins of the tongue, listen, you are the one that can control to the best of your ability your tongue. So do I. I can make sure I control mine. The Bible is so filled with passages. God has a dim view of people who are backbiters, stabbing people in the back, talking about them. Thank you, folks, for not doing that. Thank you. Tail bearer. They pick up a tail. You don't know if it's true or not. You just heard it, but it's too good not to tell. Bad idea. You don't go out and spread a thing you hear. You know, my general policy, if I hear something negative about an individual in the church, I'll take it away if I won't say anything about it. I'm going to wait, and if I hear another person comment on it, then okay, I'll listen, and I'll maybe put it away with them. That's two people. But you know, many times you hear one person just venting. I want to tell you something. Tell bearer, this right here, and tell bearer is condemned in Scripture. Proverbs 18 and 8 gives them a dim view of what a tell bearer is before the Almighty God. Friends, this is on the thrill of many, many of the description. The whole lesson could easily be all the sin. And one day, you know, we may have that here or someone else may choose to do it. Let's look at number seven. Three ways to heal your tongue. I did not want to spend the first bouts of the lesson and talk about how bad the tongue is. The tongue's a really good thing. I sort of have a whole section, and I've got a section on this, but I'll, I'm not using it today. The positive ways to use the tongue. There are several many good positive ways, but we're talking about the abuses of the tongue. But in this last division of our lesson, three ways to heal your tongue. So please get a hold of these. These are the three passages. First John 3, 4. Call it what it is. It's sin. When we sin in the tongue, it's a sin. Please remember that. Call it what it is. You know, people say, I have a weakness. I have a shortcoming. I slipped a gear. No, you sin. Wow. See, that gets a big deal. I mean, people look at it a lot different. You say, well, I, you know, I made a mistake. Oh, okay, I sinned. Whoa. I mean, you look at this guy saying, I sinned. It's a bit different because the guy, well, I made a blunder. Don't downplay your sin of lying or doing any of these other business. Make sure we hold in and we live that Christian life. Listen, we all do it from time to time. That doesn't make it right. I want us to really tighten up and do the right thing regarding our tongue. So therefore, number one, three ways to get rid of your tongue. Call it what it is. It's a sin. Don't downplay it. Don't act like it's no big deal. It is a big deal, and it should be dealt with accordingly. Number two, 1 John 1, 7, if you confess your sin, you've just admitted it's a sin, so confess your sin. You know, this is a beautiful passage. If you confess your sin, listen to the rest of that verse. If you confess your sin, God is, number one, faithful, Number two, just. Number three, to forgive us. Dear friend, the Lord just wants you to confess your sins. He said, I'm faithful to you. I'm just. I will take care of you. But from your heart, I need you to confess. This word confess means profess. To acknowledge. Acknowledge your sin. When you sin, acknowledge your sin. Confess your sin. And then, Christian friend, we're on the right road to gaining control of that little member called your tongue. 
Then number three, how to avoid and how to heal your tongue. James 4, verse 7 and 8. The Bible said, submit yourself to God, resist the devil. Listen, when you have an opportunity to say something that would please God, say it. If you're getting ready to say something that's going to disappoint God and you're going to please the devil, don't say it. You know there's a time in your life and in my life that what we really generally need to do, we need to simply wait. You know, we don't, we don't have to speak just because you think you don't have to say it. Now, when you say it, don't have to say it ugly. You be nice, respectful, polite, kind. Look to you what? Wait before you speak. Think before you speak. The Bible said be swift to hear, slow to speak. But you know, have you ever thought about this, this acronym? Why am I talking? There you go. Why am I talking? Keep your mouth shut, folks. It'll be okay. You don't have to say what's on your mind. So when you wait, <coughs> why am I talking? So with that being the case, we can learn how to make great, great strides in our spiritual life. We'll be better parents, mom to dads. We'll be better husband and wife. We'll be better sons and daughters. We'll be better New Testament Christians because we are taking the sins of the tongue seriously and weeding all of them out of our vocabulary. There's much more I could say, but that's all I'm going to say this morning. You've been wonderful. Thank you for participating with us and for listening closely, following your Bibles, taking notes. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. I just want us to hone in. I'm not worried. I'll be honest with you. I'm not worried about how we worship what we believe doctrine, how we commune and all. And I'm not worried about a basic Christian living. Most of them do a pretty good job of that. But I, I'm concerned about when we, we speak things that not spoken we should speak and then we create problems for ourselves, for others. <laughs> I'm not worried about how we worship doctrine. I'm worried about people want to call little things. That is what we say from our lips. It is so massive. The old and new testament. Many sin, many sin are other as a consequence of abusing your time. If you're not sending this morning and you're not ready to meet your maker, let's get right today. Let today be the new beginning that you are now really working hard to make sure that you're doing the right thing. If you've taken the steps of obeying the gospel and baptism, would you consider yourself in a situation where you need to confess your sin, repent of your wrongs, and have prayer? We'd be more than happy to assist that. We want to help you go to heaven. We the group of elders and deacons and teachers is the goal we have to help each other go to heaven. We work together as a spiritual family. It doesn't matter what your last name is. His blood has made us one in Christ Jesus. Please come. Watch that. Gentle shepherd.